Chapter 7 of Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup by Clarence Edward Mulford. Chapter 7 The Open Door. The proprietor of the Nugget and Rope, a German named Baum, not being troubled with police rules, kept the door wide open for the purpose of inviting trade, a proceeding not to the liking of his patrons for obvious reasons. Probably not one man in ten was fortunate enough to have no one looking for him, and the lighted interior assured good hunting to anyone in the dark street. He was continually opening the door, which every newcomer promptly and forcibly slammed shut. When he saw men walk across the room for the express purpose of slamming it, he began to cherish the idea that there was a conspiracy on foot to anger him, and thus force him to bring about his own death. After the door had been slammed three times in one evening by one man, the last slam being so forcible as to shake two bottles from the shelf and to crack the door itself, he became positive that his suspicions were correct, and so was very careful to smile and take it as a joke. Finally, wearied by his vain efforts to keep it open and fearing for the door, he hit upon a scheme, the brilliancy of which inflated his chest and gave him the appearance of a prize-winning bantam. When his patrons strolled in that night, there was no door to slam as it lay behind the bar. When Buck and Red entered, closely followed by Hopalong, they elbowed their way to the rear of the room where they could see before being seen. As yet, they had said nothing to Hopalong about Pai's warning and were debating in their minds whether they should do so or not when Hopalong interrupted their thoughts by laughing. They looked up and he nodded toward the front where they saw that anxious eyes from all parts of the room were focused on the open door. Then they noticed that it had been removed. The air of semi-hostile, semi-anxious inquiry of the patrons and the smile of satisfaction covering the face of Baum appealed to them as the most ludicrous sight their eyes had seen for months and they leaned back and roared with laughter thus calling forth sundry looks of disapproval from the innocent causes of their merriment. But they were too well known in Albuquerque to allow the disapproval to approach a serious end, and finally, as the humorous side of the situation dawned on the crowd, they joined in the laugh and all went merrily. At the psychologic moment, one shouted for a dance, and the suggestion met with uproarious approval. At that moment, Harris, the sheriff, came in, and volunteered to supply the necessary music if the crowd would pay the fine against the straying fiddler he had corralled the day before. A hat was quickly passed and a sum was realized which would pay several fines to come, and Harris departed for the music. A chair was placed on the bar for the musician, and to the tune of old Dan Tucker and an assortment of similar airs, the board floor shook and trembled. It was a comical sight, and Hopalong, the only wallflower besides Baum and the sheriff, laughed until he became weak. Cowpunchers play as they work, hard and earnestly, and there was plenty of action. Sombreros flapped like huge wings, and the baggy chaps looked like small distorted balloons. The Virginia reel was a marvel of supple, exaggerated grace, and the quadrille looked like a free-for-all for unbroken colts. The honor of prompter was conferred upon the sheriff, and he gravely called the changes as they were usually called in that section of the country. Oh, the ladies trail in, and the gents trail out, and I'll stampede down the middle. If you ain't got the tin, you can dance and shout, but you must keep up with the fiddle. As the dance waxed faster and the dancers grew hotter, hop along, feeling lonesome because he wouldn't face ridicule, even if it was not expressed, went over and stood by the sheriff. He and Harris were good friends, for he had received the wound that crippled him in saving the sheriff from assassination. Harris killed the man who had fired that shot, and from this episode on the burning desert grew a friendship that was as strong as their own natures. Harris was very well liked by the majority and feared by the rest, for he was a square man and the best sheriff the county had ever known. Quiet and unassuming, small of stature and with a kind word for everyone, he was a universal favorite among the better class of citizens. Quick as a flash and unerring in his shooting, he was a nightmare to the bad men. No profane word had ever been known to leave his lips, and he was a possessor of a widespread reputation for generosity. His face was naturally frank and open, but when his eyes narrowed with determination, it became blank and cold. 
when he saw his young friend sidle over to him he smiled and nodded a hearty welcome they's short cuttin her loose remarked hopalong first two pairs forward and back they sure is responded the prompter who's the gent playin lady to buck queried hopalong forward again and ladies change billy jordan hopalong watched the couple until they swung around and then he laughed silently buck's got too many feet he seriously remarked to his friend swing the girl you loves the best he ain't lonesome look at that two shots rang out in quick succession and harris stumbled wheeled and pitched forward on his face as hopalong's sombrero spun across his body for a second there was an intense silence heavy strained and sickening then a roar broke forth and the crowd of frenzied merrymakers headed by hopalong poured out into the street and spread out to search the town as daylight dawned the searchers began to straggle back with the same report of failure buck and red met on the street near the door and each looked questioningly at the other each shook his head and looked around their fingers toying absent-mindedly at their belts finally buck cleared his throat and remarked casually maybe he's following em red nodded and they went over toward their horses as they were hesitating which route to take billy jordan came up maybe you'd like to see your partner he's out by buzzard spring we'll take care of him jerking his thumb over his shoulder toward the saloon where harris's body lay and we'll get the others later they can't get away for long buck and red nodded and headed for buzzard spring as they neared the waterhole they saw hopalong sitting on a rock his head resting in one hand while the other hung loosely from his knee he did not notice them when they arrived and with a ready tact they sat quietly on their horses and looked in every direction except toward him the sun became a ball of molten fire and the sand flies annoyed them incessantly but still they sat and waited silent and apologetic hopalong finally rose reached for his sombrero and finding it gone swore long and earnestly at the scene its loss brought before him he walked over to his horse and leaping into the saddle turned and faced his friends you old sons of guns he said they looked sheepish and nodded negatively in answer to the look of inquiry in his eyes they ain't got em yet remarked red slowly hopalong straightened up his eyes narrowed and his face became hard and resolute as he led the way back toward the town buck rode up beside him and wiping his face with his shirt sleeve began to speak to red we might look up the joneses red they had been dodging the sheriff pretty lively lately and they was hunt and hop along ever since we had to kill their brother in buckskin they has been yappin as how they was going to wipe us out hop along and harris was standin close together and they tried for both they shot twice one for harris and one for hop along and what more do you want it sure looks that a way buck replied red biting into a huge plug of tobacco which he produced from his chaps anyhow they wouldn't be no loss if they didn't remember what pie said hopalong looked straight ahead and when he spoke the words sounded as though he had bitten them off you're right buck but i gits first try it thirsty he's my meat and i'll plug the fellow what says he ain't damn him the others replied by applying their spurs and in a short time they dismounted before the nugget and rope thirsty wouldn't have a chance to not care how he dealt the cards buck and red moved quickly through the crowd speaking fast and earnestly when they returned to where they had left their friend they saw him half a block away and they followed slowly one on either side of the street there would be no bullets in his back if they knew what they were about and they usually did as hopalong neared the corner thirsty and his two brothers turned it and saw him thirsty said something in a low voice and the other two walked across the street and disappeared behind the store when assured that they were secure thirsty walked up to a huge boulder on the side of the street farthest from the store and turned and faced his enemy who approached rapidly until about five paces away when he slowed up and finally stopped for a number of seconds they sized each other up hop along quiet and deliberate with a deadly hatred thirsty pale and furtive with a sensation hitherto unknown to him it was right meeting wrong and wrong lost confidence often had thirsty jones looked death in the face and laughed but there was something in hopalong's eyes that made his flesh creep he glanced quickly past his foe and took in the scene with one flash of his eyes there was the crowd 
eager, expectant, scowling. There were Buck and Red, each lounging against a boulder, Buck on his right, Red on his left. Before him stood the only man he had ever feared. Hopalong shifted his feet, and Thirsty, coming to himself with a start, smiled. His nerve had been shaken, but he was master of himself once more. Well, he snarled, scowling. Hopalong made no response, but stared him in the eyes. Thirsty expected action, and the deadly quiet of his enemy oppressed him. He stared in turn, but the insistent searching of his opponent's eyes scorched him, and he shifted his gaze to Hopalong's neck. Well, he repeated uneasily. Did you have a nice time at the dance last night? asked Hopalong, still searching the face before him. Was there a dance? I was over in Alameda, replied Thirsty shortly. Yes, there was a dance, and you can shoot pretty darn far if you was in Alameda, responded Hopalong, his voice low and monotonous. Thirsty shifted his feet and glanced around. Buck and Red were still lounging against their boulders, and apparently were not paying any attention to the proceedings. His fickle nerve came back again, for he knew he would receive fair play. So he faced Hopalong once more, and regarded him with a cynical smile. You seems to worry a whole lot about me. Is it because you has a tender feeling, or because it's none of your blame business? He asked aggressively. Hopalong paled with sudden anger, but controlled himself. It's because you murdered Harris, he replied. Shoo, and how does you figure it out? asked Thirsty jauntily. He was hunting you hard, and you thought you'd stop it, so you came in to lay for him. When you saw me and him together, you saw the chance to wipe out another score. That's how I figure it out, replied Hopalong quietly. You're a regular detective, aren't you? asked Thirsty ironically. I've got common sense, responded Hopalong. You has. You better tell the rest that, too, replied Thirsty. I know you shot Harris, and you can't get out of it by making funny remarks. Anyhow, you won't be much loss, and the stage company will feel better, too. Shoo! And suppose I did shoot him, I'd done a good job, didn't I? You did the worst job you could do, you highway robber, softly said Hopalong, at the same time moving nearer. Harris knew you stopped the stage last month, and that's why you've been dodging him. You're a liar, shouted Thirsty, reaching for his gun. The movement was fatal, for before he could draw, the colt in Hopalong's holster leaped out and flashed from its owner's hip, and Thirsty fell sideways, face down in the dust of the street. Hopalong started toward the fallen man, but as he did so, a shot rang out from behind the store, and he pitched forward, stumbled, and rolled behind the boulder. As he stumbled, his left hand streaked to his hip, and when he fell he had a gun in each hand. As he disappeared from sight, Goodeye and Bill Jones stepped from behind the store and started to run away. Not able to resist the temptation to look again, they stopped and turned, and Bill laughed. Easy as sin, he said. Run, you fool. Red and Buck will be here. Want to get plugged? shouted Goodeye angrily. They turned and started for a group of ponies twenty yards away, and as they leaped into the saddles, two shots were fired from the street. As the reports died away, Buck and Red turned the corner of the store, colts in hand and checking their rush as they saw the saddles emptied. They turned toward the street and saw Hopalong, with blood oozing from an abrasion on his cheek, sitting up cross-legged with each hand holding a gun, from which came thin wisps of smoke. The son of a gun, cried Buck, proud and delighted. The son of a gun, echoed Red, grinning. End of chapter 7 The Open Door